talk about is Anna's 90 years old. Yay! And so this is a birthday for her, too. Happy birthday. Are you really, really? Yes, yeah, sure. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Anna. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. No, someone yes to do the cut. Okay. Oh, the ceremony. Well, I think we all should have a hand in it. Well, it's just not big enough for us all to have a hand. Yeah, you have to work, but somebody has to work. Okay, yeah. Everybody, while we're cutting, make a wish for Anna. Good health. Good health, definitely. Lots of love and many more years. And back on the show soon. Ready? Set. And they introduce to you Susan Brown. She has something very special. She wants to read to you and to Anna. Hi. Um, when Leslie told me about Anna's special day and her birthday, I racked my brain. I thought, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? You know, something really special because she's like a mentor. I mean, she's everybody's mentor to be in this business, to be that old, to still be working, to be the person she is. And so uh, I, I opened a drawer in my desk, and oddly enough, there was this speech that her husband, Robert Nathan, at his birthday, when he was 85 years old, had written. And it was, and I'd asked for it because it was so special, I thought, having gone to that birthday party. And I thought, thank you, God, for leading me to this drawer. And here is Robert Nathan's 85th birthday which was in March 1979, and this is what he wrote, part of it. I'm trying not to read all of it. Right? Robert Nathan was a writer, for those of you who don't know, an extraordinary man, an extraordinary wit and sage and writer, and um, he wrote a Portrait of Jenny, for one thing, which became a great movie at the time. And he was wife. a wife, what? Bishop's wife. The Bishop's wife, exactly, yes. And, um, and he was married. And he was married to Anna. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, he was her husband. Holy smokes, Susan. She had really? many of them. Yes, she did. Oh, wow. She had five, didn't she? Yeah. yeah. Well, he says, a funny thing happened to me on the way to this last hurrah. I grew old. It was a complete surprise to me. I always knew that if people live long enough, they grow old. But somehow it didn't seem to apply to me. Until one morning during the Tutankhamun thing last year, that was an Egyptian show at the uh, museum, I happened to come on a picture of the mummy of Ramses II, staring right at me out of a newspaper. And I realized that for the past few weeks, or maybe months, I had been looking at that same face, or an awfully good in imitation of it, every morning in my shaving mirror. It gave me rather a nasty shock, even though my wife dismissed it as nonsense. My wife, as you probably know, is English, and she insists that I look like the Duke of Wellington. She herself is a perfect combination of Florence Nightingale, Botticelli's Venus, and Queen Victoria. A very singular angel. Without her, I wouldn't be here and Great Britain wouldn't be there. <laughs> However, to return to Ramses, there we were, two old men, one in his 80s and the other 3,000 years older, looking at each other, and looking so alike except for the complexion. All his friends, including, I wouldn't be surprised, an ancestor or two of mine, were gone long ago. And so many of mine, too, the writers and the poets of the 20s and the 30s, so many of them forgotten. A few still remembered for something they wrote or did. 
Stephen Bernay for John Brown's Body, Scott Fitzgerald for Gatsby and Dancing in a Fountain, Edna St. Vincent Millay for Burning Her Candle at Both Ends, and Eleanor Wiley for Her Beauty. I'm just a survivor. It's not altogether bad being a survivor. People help you up and down the steps. You get the most comfortable chair, and you're supposed to know a lot. Actually, in Jack Smith's column the other day, I was nominated as a sage. I lost out to Will Durant, who is lots older than me and a lot sagier than I am. <laughs> and a lot jollier, too. But the most curious and perhaps the most important thing about growing old is that you don't feel old. Not really. Not inside. Because despite all the usual aches and pains deep inside, there's something that keeps on being you, just as you always were sense of self, of indestructible self. And another thing you don't lose, along with the sense of being you, is the sense of love. It's still there with you, just as it used to be. It may have lost a bit of its ardor, but it's not its sweetness. It may have lost some of its innocence, but never its beauty. It's never crabbed, I never saw that woman do anything but smile, look interested, be vitally, vitally alive. And she brought something every day that I saw her on the set. She was one of those rare people that brought qualities. You can't learn it in an acting school. You can't be taught how to do it by the best teacher. She was so likable and so alive that every scene that she was in sparkled more because of her. Now with all of that, she really is, and always has been as long as I've known her, kind of an inspiration. So wouldn't you think that I would think of her with great joy? Well, I do and I appreciate her, but she, it's really, she makes me really sad because I know that the best day I ever lived and the best day I will ever have, I will never look as good as that 90 year old. <laughs> well, of course, I'm going to come up here and change the pace about you, Anna, <laughs> because I know you for all 25 years that you've been there. And you know that I've always called you the nymphomaniac of Fort Charles. <laughs> this woman has the most wicked sense of humor you could possibly imagine. This angelic face is one of the sexiest people you will ever meet in your life. I have on my wall of my dressing room, and I have had it for over 20 years, a light switch that Anna gave me and it is a picture of a man flashing. <laughs> so the light switch fits over, and he's got his pulse like this. And I brought it with me from every studio that we've been in, and it's still there. And to further emphasize that point, every Christmas, Anna would give me a calendar and each day of the calendar that you would rip off had the dirtiest joke you ever saw in life. <laughs> so Anna, all your loveliness, all your charm, all your beauty, 
and that wicked, wicked side of you, I will always love you for it because it just made you that much more cute. Hello? Which one's the louder, right? Well, I have to speak because, after all, I am her favorite grandchild. Um, Anna, I think I started calling her like an angel when I first started working with her because there's something really, truly angelic about her. Her husband said it, singularly angelic. You know, she's just, uh, well, I was, I've been on the show now for 12 years. And I don't know how long she's been in the, uh, the wheelchair, but from the time I've been there, she was always sort of, you know, wheeled on, and she had to wheel herself off. But she just carried herself, you never thought of her as being in a wheelchair. She just didn't carry herself like that, like she was handicapped. But she's uh, a lovely lady, of course, raised in, in Great Britain, but some of you may not know this, but she and I have actually a special, special bond that there's only a few people have. And, uh, and that is that we both worked on Montana cattle ranches. I think it was husband number three. It was a Montana cowboy. And he had a ranch. And, uh, and Anna would, we would talk about that. I can't remember exactly where it was in Montana. But she would, uh, she worked, I think a couple of years out there. This beautiful, queenly, regal lady out there in the Montana badlands taking care of this cattle. I think she spent one winter, I think that was it. But uh, I love the fact that she, uh, that she lived in Montana because as most of you know, I lived in Montana for my uh, growing up years. But um, anyway, that's what I, I have a special bond with, with Anna for that reason. And I think that's also why I have a special place in my heart for her. And I'm sorry that she couldn't be here today. And uh, I hope to see you soon back on the set. And I love you, love you very much. Happy birthday. Well, hey Anna, not bad, huh? Um, Anna and I go back a long, long way. When I, actually, uh, I hadn't been on, on GH yet, but she, I lived on Doheny and she lives on Doheny. And when we finally got together on GH, I would go and visit her and Robert. Um, she wasn't all there at the, one of the times, and I would go up and just actually listen to Robert because he was so wonderful, such a brilliant, as Susan said, brilliant writer and author. And in fact, uh, he wrote something that Stuart and I uh, were asked to read. It was called... Juliet in Padua, which he had written, and it was about Romeo and Juliet, but they lived. <laughs> and this was 10 years later. And funny he asked Stuart and I, because this was a couple that didn't really get along. <laughs> anyway, she was visiting a queen once. She was really, she knew the queen. In fact, when I first had my first trip to, uh, to London, I ran up and I said, I'm going, I'm going to Europe. And she said, that's nice, dear. Now, do you have a pencil? Yeah, yeah. All right, write this down. It's the, it's the Queen's Equerries number. It's the palace number. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the person I was going with, I took that number and I went over and he was from London. And I said, listen, do you want to hang on to the palace number? You should I. And he just looked at me and he went, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> and with that number, I got a private tour of the Queen's equerry, the equerry, with the equerry, Sir John William, the stables where the golden coach is. And I got to put my hand where the Queen's bummy had been. <laughs> how many, how, who of you can say that, that they have actually put their hand where the Queen's bummy has been? <laughs> And if you go to Anna's house, you'll see there is a letter from the Queen to her thanking her for something. It's just wonderful. And I have to say, there are so many wonderful things. One that does stand out in my mind, because when Anna was in a wheelchair, I was designated driver for a lot of functions, and I would drive her, and she would tell me about the way Hollywood looked, and Coldwater Canyon looked 
Oh, that was fascinating. I took her to a wedding once, one of the gals on the show, a makeup gal, and I uh, was getting married. And we came in, and I said hi to everybody, and Anna was in her wheelchair. And I parked Anna, and I went and talked to all those people, and I forgot I parked Anna in front of an ice sculpture. <laughs> she said it melted a lot. <laughs> I kind of forgot. <laughs> I learned about Anna in the wheelchair after that, but I left her there for quite a while. Anna, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm really, really sorry. But thank you all for loving Anna as much as I do, for sharing the wonderful memories and thoughts we have of her. And as I know you all do, as I do, wish her well, wish her back, and soon. So we love you, Anna. Thank you.